When thousands of other men's sons were killed, we called it victory and celebrated with beer. And when thousands of our sons were killed, they called it victory and celebrated with wine. Hello, and welcome to season four of How Would Lubitsch Do It, a podcast in which we discuss the works of director Ernst Lubitsch, one film at a time. It's 1932, and Will Sloan joins us to discuss The Man I Killed, also known as Broken Lullaby. Come visit ErnstCast.com if you'd like show notes, resources as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing, a link to our Discord, or just to say hi. We are here with Will Sloan. Will, I have two questions for you. One, who are you? What do you do? And two, what about Ernst Lubitsch made you want to come on this podcast? Uh, thanks for having me. Uh, as to who I am, I am a writer and podcast mogul. Uh, my writing appears regularly in Cinemascope and other journals, and I host two podcasts. One is called The Important Cinema Club, which is a film history podcast, and the other is called Michael and Us, which is a culture and politics podcast. Now, with Lubitsch, I think I have a pretty normal relationship with Lubitsch. I like the ones that everyone likes. There are Plenty of deeper cut ones I haven't seen and that, you know, I look forward to a lifetime of exploring those. My favorite one is probably To Be or Not To Be. I really think it's one of the great comedies of all time. Certainly the funniest Jack Benny has ever been on screen or off. This movie that we're going to talk about, Broken Lullaby, which is one I only saw for the first time fairly recently. I watched it on the Criterion channel in their pre-code Paramount lineup just seeing that it was a Lubitsch film and not quite knowing what to expect. I mean, this movie is very different from those more iconic Lubitsch ones, and I think I appreciate it in a very different way. And I think I was interested in bringing this one to this podcast, among other things, to talk with, you know, you, who is very deeply immersed in Lubitsch, about kind of where to situate it in that vast body of work. This one gets brought up a surprising amount among the guests I've had. And I think it gets brought up because it's such an anomaly. It's his only sound drama. Mm -hmm. He's made other films that incorporate dramatic elements, like as we know, To Be or Not To Be has a half an hour period in the middle when there's nary a laugh. But this film is fully self-serious drama that, I mean, I think the last time I can say he did something that was this purely dramatic was probably all the way back with The Flame. The last time he produced a film that was purely a drama, we can't know this for sure because it's lost, is The Patriot. And prior to that, you have to go all the way back to his Berlin period to get to his, you know, big historical melodramas. So this film is completely sincere. And also, I think, one that really divides people, because for every person I've talked to who says, oh, yeah, Broken Lullaby shows he, can, he could do drama and he could have had a great dramatic career. There's another that went, wow, that was a misfire. Glad he didn't do that anymore. Yeah, yeah. That's definitely the sense I get from its critical reception. I mean, I read Pauline Kael's review where she's very down on it. In the current issue of Sight and Sound, there's a review by Henry K. Miller of two new blu-ray releases the other one is bluebeard's eighth wife and yeah the tone of the review is it's kind of so down on broken lullaby i was a little surprised because i i responded to broken lullaby very strongly i like it a great deal and i can see the flaws but i think i like the movie i like the flaws in addition to everything else i wouldn't change anything about the movie yeah, I think I'm uh, very on brand. I'm a real fence sitter on this one. Great. Yeah, I can get into my thoughts more fully on it later. But to provide some background on this film, there's so much about this film that I think makes it of interest historically. One is that it comes at a time when Lubitsch's most consistent collaborator up until the sound era was Hans Crowley who, uh, if we know our Lubitsch lore, ran off with Lubitsch's wife, <laughs> which, uh, you know, torched that relationship. So, you know, Lubitsch has been running between writers, and this is his first collaboration with Samson Rafelson, who comes aboard alongside Ernest Vida, who has written a few of the previous films. And this becomes probably Lubitsch's key writing collaboration throughout the rest of his career. This was actually the first film they wrote together, although Smiling Lieutenant came out first. Not only that, but, you know, we come at a time when Paramount, which is, you know, the studio that Lubitsch is tied to at this point is undergoing tremendous financial stress. You know, the Great Depression is, is fully in swing at this point. Their books are in very bad shape. And this film was also a fairly big bomb. 
Uh, it costs a lot of money. It costs more than I think his musicals had up to this point, which is a little surprising to me, given that the film is so humble in its trappings. There's a lot going on here. And then you have the fact that this is a shockingly pacifist film. It's one of those wonderful films that could only have been made at the point it was made, right? You couldn't have made this five years later. You couldn't have made this five years earlier. This specific kind of anti-war sentiment feels so in line with Lubitsch's experiences, you know, in having been on the German side of World War One. you know, he didn't fight. He was just in Berlin, you know, making movies. But, uh, but yeah, there's so much here. What are your thoughts in the film? The initial response just from the opening scenes are how different it is tonally from the classic Lubitsch movies. Mm -hmm. Those movies are, I mean, we all know they're light, they're sophisticated, they're dryly funny, you know, often understatedly funny, and hardly an original observation, but so many of them are sort of have this kind of mid-Atlantic quality. But this one, you know, it's a full-on three-hanky weeper, very heavy-duty, dramatic acting, also very deeply rooted in this sense of post-war trauma. And I think what spoke to me was this air of death that hangs over it, honestly. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful movie about grief and loss. I've never experienced anything like the loss of a child, but like you can't get through life without losing someone close to you. And I think there's a lot in this movie that rings true to how it works. And we can get in this probably more as it goes along, but like this is a family, it's a town that is sort of just paralyzed by death. And like death and life are almost these opposing forces. And I think, I don't know, when I was a kid, and didn't know anything about loss. I think I would have assumed, you know, you have a funeral and then you have two weeks where you're really sad and then you just get normal. But in this, you sort of feel first the death of this soldier overseas, but also the deaths of all these soldiers overseas and the stunning absence that is felt in this town. And, you know, what do you do when it seems there are no viable ways to fill that absence, no realistic strategies to fill it? And, you know, this movie ends in a place that's very strange, very ambiguous, I think. And I think the emotions of the film are very complex and ambiguous in a way that I think makes this, for me, one of the best films I've seen about the subjects of grief and mourning. When the film is at its best, it's really grappling with the you know, unimaginable suffering inflicted by this war, right? I mean, uh, in World War One, 15% of Germans died. And the way this film deals with that, I found so interesting because this might be the first example of the thing that, you know, Lubitsch would repeat again and again from going on, which is casting, you know, these very American actors. He would do this uh, in his musicals, but this is the first time I think that he really used it in quite this way, which is he cast these American actors speaking uninflected English as members of different, in this case, European nations. And so, you know, you have this textual context of, OK, mm -hmm. this film is set largely in Germany, in a country where 15 percent of the population has just died. And yet, by the fact that everyone in the film is speaking perfect uninflected English, there's this way in which he blurs the line between the American viewers who are the target audience of the film and this calamity that might seem foreign to, you know, your bog standard American circa 1932. It brings it home. And I mean, it also has that wonderful little plot device element of it allows the scene in which our lead character reveals he is French, even though it would be very obvious because he would be speaking German in heavily <laughs> with a heavy French accent. So there is that too. And that becomes a plot device later. But yeah, the way that he blurs where this is a town in Germany, but it's also a town in America simultaneously. You also mentioned the sort of pre-code aspect of it. I mean, we, you know, when we think of a pre-code movie, we, we typically think of like, you know, sexy, crime-ridden dramas and yeah. yeah, sexually suggestive comedies and that sort of thing. Like this is a World War I movie at a time when a number of World War I movies are being made in the American cinema that are quite downbeat and very much not rah-rah movies, you know, All Quiet on the Western Front being the yeah. prototypical example, but also I believe Howard Hawks made one, the title of which is escaping me right now. And eight or nine years after this, they're making movies like Sergeant York that are kind of almost reframing World War I as if it's World War II. Yeah. The film's depiction of World War I, I think it's interesting how apolitically the town views it and how 
it, World War One is seen as this force that nobody understands why it was fought, what it was fought for, but what they know is that it had for the Germans, it had a French face, and so it was just this force of like death and destruction, and that was the enemy. And yeah, that confusion and despair is the way the film treats the First World War also speaks to me. There's this vague sense, I guess it's not so vague at certain points, but there's a sense that you have these shady forces at the top of the countries, right? Who have gone to war for their own arcane reasons. And we're just seeing the detritus of that. Also, I mean, I'm from Canada where we have a very particular First World War story where Yes. You know, central to our national myth is that, I mean, you, I'm sure you learned this in school as well. Central to our national myth is that we were basically an appendage of the United Kingdom. When they declared war, we joined with them. Maybe they teach it differently in schools now. We were taught we proved ourselves so well that in the next yes. war, they let us be our own country. That's what we learned yeah. in school. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because our entire East Coast was basically mowed down. Like we lost, you know, 90,000 young men and still haven't recovered from it 100 years later. Mm -hmm. Then when World War II came along, we declared war a whole three days after Britain did. And that, you know, that made us a country. That's independence. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And everything else I learned about the First World War was just like, oh, yeah, I mean, it was just it was awful. It was like there'd be these battles where, you know, our allies would gain, you know, five feet of muddy land and then they'd lose it the next day and then they'd gain it and then they'd lose it all of a sudden. And in the midst of this, tens of thousands of people are just being killed. And why was the war fought? There was an archduke who was shot and it was the result of all of these tensions it didn't seem like a good price to pay to then be seen as a country in the eyes of our colonial father. So I'm not sure quite how I got off on that, but I think I think something about how the war is depicted in this movie rings true with, like, I can imagine people on the East Coast of Canada or anywhere in Canada, I can imagine communities like the one in this movie existing, like, all over the world, beset by the same sort of grief and confusion. The film is an interesting, in that context, kind of call again xenophobia. Mm -hmm. It's tough to reduce the film down to a single theme, but a prominent one is just this idea that these two countries, in this case, France and Germany, fought and many died, you know, Im implied pointlessly. And that the film is about the process of reconciling. And, you know, part of what makes the ending, which we'll get to the ending because it's one of the most perverse endings I've ever seen in a, in a film. Part of what makes it so powerful to me is that it's about the kind of, in this case, the sacrifice that goes into this. You know, once again, the younger generations mm -hmm. are sacrificing for the older generation's peace of mind right. so that they can mend these bridges. But this film is so blunt and I think powerful, especially in its opening scene about the, you know, the traumatic experience of the war. I was actually kind of surprised that the film, you know, without saying it, basically deals with PTSD from the get-go. Right. So, I mean, the, the movie opens with one of its most heavily dramatic scenes with this French soldier, this former French soldier named Paul Renard, played by Phillips Holmes, mm -hmm. who comes to a church and goes to confession and confesses about killing this soldier, this German soldier during the First World War, and how he sort of held the soldier's body in his arms. The soldier didn't even fight back. And as he died, he found a letter that the soldier wrote tucked into a book. And Ever since then, he's been haunted, haunted by the memory, like, as you say, PTSD. And basically, to kind of get rid of him, the priest gives him absolution and says, oh, you want to go over to Germany and make it up to the family? Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's like, knock yourself out. Yeah. Yeah. Go deliver that letter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's another pre-code thing about the film, right? I mean, mm -hmm. immediately mm -hmm. the clergy is hypocritical. You say you murdered someone and then immediately, oh, it was war. You're fine. Attaboy. You that's know, right. Go to Germany and make good, whatever, whatever helps you sleep at night. It's brutal. And so when he gets to Germany, Again, he finds this town, this small town that's paralyzed by, you know, you get a sense that every family has a son who's been lost in this war. And one of the families, the Holderlin family, the patriarch is Lionel Barrymore, as uh, Dr. Holderin. Mm -hmm. His wife is an actress who I was not particularly familiar with. I guess she was in I Am a Fugitive from the Chain Gang, but Louise Carter as Frau Holderin, the soldier that he killed, Walter, her fiance. Fraulein Elsa, played by Nancy Carroll. And she continues to live with the dead soldier's parents in this family unit that they've formed. She's basically a, a widow without even having been married. And yeah, the family is, the doctor is still a 
prominent member of the community, but the wife, her life is basically over at this point. She lives only to visit the grave. There's a sort of uncertainty to what extent Elsa's life is over. There's an early scene where another prominent member of the community comes, you know, some kind of like, you know, nouveau riche, older, like asshole comes saying, well, hey, you know, uh, why don't, uh, why don't I take Elsa's hand in marriage? Would you, would you allow me that? I mean, I'm a very prominent man in a prominent position. And she turns him away. The pickings for a husband are pretty slim when he comes, you know, because again, every young man in the community has basically been killed. I want to add a little asterisk on that because before the scene in which we see our main character in the cathedral, there's this incredible montage that kind of summarizes the whole war. Cannons marching and then cut to, you know, uh, this typical Lubitsch shot of all the soldiers marching down, you know, the Parisian Boulevard, framed by a one-legged man. You have all these soldiers marching, and in the foreground, unseen, is the casualty. So, you know, immediately, we're given the wider scope before we focus on this one person. Yeah, and I mean, that also speaks to something that was happening, particularly in Europe at that time, where not only were so many people dead, but people every day were seeing these war veterans who came home disfigured or amputated. Mm -hmm. the, the legacy of the war was a constant, very in your face. One was being reminded of it every day. And there's a very powerful scene, I think, early on where Frau Holderlin is in the cemetery visiting her son's grave. And there's another bereaved mother there. And they have this conversation. Again, it's a very, I think, atypical Lubitsch scene, a very like three hanky weeper scene where the other mother says, we must learn not to weep and love what we have left. There are so many years ahead of us. And this speaks to, I think, one of the dilemmas that this movie articulates very well, which is for these old women who their son has died in the war, what exactly do they have to live for at this point? I'm not saying that in an uncharitable way, but it's like, that's the movie's rhetorical device, though. Yeah. Like the key fact of their life, the thing they loved the most and the thing that their life's work, basically, their son, you know, they are stay at home mothers who tended to the family. The son is gone. And so how do you get out from the crushing weight of that absence? It's not an easy absence to fill. And when she says there are so many years ahead of us, that's a very powerful statement, too, because like. The grief doesn't go away. The absence is still there and the absence never mm -hmm. fills and in some ways can become more painful as it goes along. That was a line that specifically stuck with me, the ending, because when that line is spoken in that scene, I immediately thought, oh, that, that's interesting because so many of these films about, you know, grieving parents of maybe dead children kind of imply that they're always on this death's door and, you know, there's, you always get the plot device where the parent dies soon after. But this implies a trauma that lasts a while. And then the dramatic configuration of the very ending, you imply this kind of hell <laughs> that everyone's in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Or, or like right after the cemetery scene or shortly after it, there's a scene where the family you know, Lionel Barrymore, his wife and the daughter-in-law are having dinner at the table and in the Lubitsch frames, you know, noticeably, but without really calling heavy attention to it, the empty chair in the foreground, mm -hmm. they still have that fourth chair at the table. And the conversation they have there, which is not scored to any music, like there are moments in the conversation where they laugh or where they try to bring up pleasant subjects. And it always kind of fizzles out, you know, it's not like it descends into like everybody crying. It's mm -hmm. just you feel the absence very strongly and you feel the absence in the way that Lubitsch films it and scores it. You know, you feel the absence in how you hear the clicking of the spoons and forks against the plates. Yeah, like in a movie that whose tone careens wildly between like heavy duty emotion and a scene like this that is kind of austere. This is on the austere end. One of the things I find interesting about it, even though I personally find that it maybe isn't the best interest of the film, is that Lubitsch, I can feel him straining at so many points to nail this tone where, you know, sometimes it feels like his strategy is like in that scene. I think that dinner scene is wonderful where, you know, it's this understated use of objects in this case and the kind of empty space between words and around the characters to evoke a loss. And then in other scenes, um, we have these early 30s acting typical melodramatics, right, where we have, mm -hmm. I mean, especially I'm, you have Phillips Holmes, I think, who maybe struggles the most where he goes from this very reserved kind of uh, stance to, you know, maybe big, you know, 
waving out his arms. I'm doing it on camera right now. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Throwing himself over his scene partner. These big melodramatic gestures that sometimes feel slightly at odds with <laughs> some of the other material. It feels like Lubitsch is kind of, instead of picking a strategy, he's almost testing the waters in a few different directions. Yeah, I don't have a rebuttal to that, except that I kind of find it all endearing. There's one scene also that is very powerful to me, and it's the scene where the protagonist, Paul Renard, appears at Lionel Barrymore's office for the first time. Mm -hmm. And Barrymore, in finding out that he's French, immediately becomes very indignant and says, to me, every Frenchman is the murderer of my son. And then he immediately begins to compose himself. And I'm not bringing this up as a sort of like aesthetic defense of the movie. Mm -hmm. I think it's probably, you know, it's probably unintentional, but I think the movie does capture something of the extremes of emotion that somebody in like the position that these characters are in. The fact that they can have this, yeah, this extreme anger, this extreme pain, having to coexist with like the quotidian details of their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why the sort of like all over the place tone of the movie works for me. It might be something I'm projecting onto the film, but I'm not unmoved by the various shades of emotion. Yeah, it's one of those things where in the moment I'm often taken with it and then it will kind of give me a slight whiplash another moment. Um, mm -hmm. One element in the kind of middle of the film that I do think is quite well handled is the courtship between mm -hmm. uh, Paul and Elsa. You have the lovely scene where they're you know, walking down the road and the town's kind of simultaneous bewilderment and excitement at this development, you know, because this is their version of television, is expressed by the tinkling of doorbells, right? Or the uh, of windows, mm -hmm. you know, the little bells in the windows. So they're walking down the street and you hear a bell and another bell. And that's, you know, that reminds us that they're being watched by this community. They're being policed. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a simultaneous tension there that's it's played for dramatic effect in one way, but it's also typical Lubitsch wit. It's, it's a little bit whimsical. Actually, yeah, I guess I do see the Lubitsch in that. I'm curious, do you see other elements of Lubitsch in there, like whether it's in the visual style or in the tone of the film? What stuck out at me immediately was the use of framing. Lubitsch, especially in this period, loved framing his shots with some sort of foreground element wrapping around it. The Merry Widow, I think, is my favorite example of this, where you have these occasional very almost poetic shots where you'll cut out from a scene and you'll see someone kind of obliquely listening in on what's going on in the foreground in an almost sinister way. In this one, you have that shot I mentioned of the parade being framed by the amputee soldier, but you have so many scenes where the perspective might suddenly shift to an outsider looking in. That lovely bit at the end, for example, of the scene where um, Paul and Elsa walk down the boulevard, or the, I would say that the town's only road. Instead of seeing the end of their conversation, you cut to an overhead point of view shot of a woman in a window where we don't see what they're saying. Clearly some very powerful words are being passed, but we're denied them. We know what they're saying in the sense that we're given enough information before and after to figure it out, but we are denied the kind of satisfaction of hearing it. Instead, you know, that shot does two things, right? One, it, it elides something, which Lubitsch loves. And two, it also emphasizes the relationship of the townspeople to, we might call them leads. I would also point out the rhythm of the editing. Lubitsch, as he was infamous for at this time, you know, would be in the editing room with scissors, editing his movies. And, you know, that opening with the sudden like bam, bam, bam montage. And then the way the film kind of careens pacing wise between these very fast little moments that feel like almost violations and long, long unbroken sequences and scenes with Aaron, them, there's a lot that rhymes with his other works. So definitely a few little aesthetic things that I went, OK, or even the camera movement. There's a couple of lovely crane shots that feel very of a piece with something like Eternal Love. I'd be lying if I said that the film wasn't a bit more anonymous than like, you know, The Merry Widow or Trouble in Paradise or something like that. It doesn't feel as quintessentially Lou Bitch, but there's a lot there. Having been immersed in his biography, how personal a project was this for him and how pleased with it was he? Do we know? That's actually one thing where in the biography, biographies I've read of him. I don't know how he felt about it, but we know about how a lot of the people who worked on this felt about it. The two writers, Vida and Rifelson, didn't like the final project. There was a lot of unease around it throughout its creative process, and it was seen as a failure. And I do think there's maybe some evidence that Lubitsch either artistically or commercially realized this might not be the best card to play, you know, judging by the fact that he never, in his lifetime, he never realized a project that was this sincerely melodramatic again.
he's someone who very few interviews with survive. But I think we can kind of infer that specifically the story of German tragedy, this loss of just an entire generation in World War One, where I mean, every participant in World War One lost people, but Germany, by dint of being, you know, the loser, it hit them particularly hard, the deprivation of that. And I do think it's no coincidence that Lubitsch, as someone who lived through that, has a certain perspective at this point, at least. I mean, I think his perspective on war would change for obvious reasons shortly thereafter. But at this point in his life, it makes sense to me that Lubitsch would be drawn to a project that is about the pointlessness and irrecoverable loss of World War I. So that does make sense to me. So why don't we talk about the ending? Because I am very eager to talk about it. Yes, it's my favorite part of the whole movie. I just love it. <laughs> I think a good way to introduce this ending is to talk about the ending of the film France which is the Francois Ozon remake of Broken Lullaby. The Ozon movie kind of ends on a more uh, 21st century, one might call a feminist note, in that it's about the character of Anna, who is Elsa, basically breaking free of this whole entire town. Adrian, who is the Paul character in this, heads off to Paris. Anna has fallen in love with him. Anna goes to Paris and in this process realizes that he was actually never really in love with her, that all he wanted was forgiveness. And she takes this as an opportunity to kind of say to hell with this whole situation. I'm living on my own. And But what she does is she writes to her parents as if she was still in a relationship with Adrian to kind of satiate them. That feels like Ozone trying to complicate the ending. And I think it reflects very well on Lubitsch's ending. Mm -hmm which is our lead character, Paul, who has lied to this family. He's lied to Elsa's family, right? He has not told them that he killed their son. He has told them that he was a friend of their son in Paris based on this letter he found. And so, you know, him and Elsa fall in love, begin a relationship. Eventually, Paul breaks and admits to Elsa that he killed her fiancé. <laughs> and uh, she's, you know, it tears her apart as Paul goes to tell her parents about this. She interrupts him, barges in and stops him from admitting it. And they uh, announce their plans to marry. On the grounds that, like, you've brought light to yes. this old woman's eyes for the first time in years. You know, how dare you at this point take it away? If you take it away from her, you're, you'll kill her. Exactly. And basically, he realizes he has to become their son, <laughs> you know? He has to take the place of the man he killed. Yeah. And he, it is implied, realizes that, like, this is, this is karma. This is just. This is th this is the correct thing to happen. There's this lovely close up of him where I think it's the yeah. best bit of performance in the film where you can see him realize you can see the look crawl across his face of like, oh, this is faded. <laughs> I need to do this. Yeah. This is how I repent. Yeah. And there's also some ambiguity about, yes, you know, he relieves this family of, of their grief or leavens it at least. But then he also leavens himself of the horrible guilt that has been you know, following him around in the years since the First World War ended. So like on some level, I think there's an implication that he's doing it for himself as well. It's not merely a selfless act. The way the scene is played, though, because the film ends with him beginning to play the composition on his violin and then Elsa joins in on the piano. It's kind of implied, you know, she has to unlock the piano, which, you know, it's uh, she's finally playing music again is the implication. But the way the scene place tonally is the least triumphant thing I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> yes. You know, there's this dolly shot that that reveals them all. And it's this incredibly effed up family unit that they formed now where two of them are living this hellish lie, <laughs> create essentially a false reality for the parents. The parents are now living in their own. And the other the other two are in the Matrix. Basically. Exactly. Yeah. You know, they're, they're, yeah. They've yeah. given them their own safe <laughs> bubble in which to l spend out the rest of their years in happiness in a lie. When in fact, they're literally sharing the house with the man who killed their son. <laughs> the ambiguity is, OK, if not this, then what? Like, mm -hmm. basically, these parents have kind of given up all hope of happiness. And what would be that some other young man comes along, you mm -hmm. know, who's not living a lie. <laughs> but it also seems that her the daughter-in-law's only potential gentleman suitors are like 60-year-old men who are colleagues of the Lionel Barrymore character. I think... Even though the film ends, you know, as it fades out into the final title cards, it kind of fades out on the on this like swelling of the orchestra. I do think by the way that he shoots that shot, he it's laden with ambiguity. It's not a triumphant conclusion. 
it's not a wholly tragic conclusion either. It's just a very, it's a very strange conclusion. The implication of the life that's about to be led by Paul and Elsa is so fascinating to me where it's, they're going to have to spend. <laughs> are they in love still? Like yeah, It's completely ambiguous whether they're still in love. Yeah. I mean, I can't imagine yeah. her still being in love <laughs> after the yeah. revelation <laughs> and just them having to live the rest of their days in a double life. I mean, um, what happens when, not if they have kids? <laughs> are they gonna? Yes. Are they gonna have to carry this yes. lie to their graves? Because I think they are. It feels like a Twilight Zone ending where it's so perfectly ironic. They're trapped in this hell of their own creation. Maybe not of their own creation. In this case, it's this hell that has been made inevitable by forces of war. But it's also this implication that this is the only way for this little micro society to move forward in a strange way. Paul has brought peace to not only this family but to this community. By kind of becoming the Frenchman who now lives among them yeah. to heal those wounds. He's had to sacrifice himself to do that, though. Possibly, but possibly in sacrificing himself, he's also brought peace to himself. Possibly the only two options for him are this like sick new life mm -hmm. or suicide, like because he's so haunted by what he's done in the war. I like to think there could be a third option, but th those seem to be what he thinks are the options before him. And lots of couples therapy, you know. <laughs> yeah. I do think that on this viewing, which was my second viewing, I thought there was an interesting um, rhyme between one of the early shots in the film, which is this quite long insert of a uh, idol of Christ. So we immediately introduce this idea of martyrdom, mm -hmm. right? Of mm -hmm. this guy who essentially has come to the conclusion that one way or another, he's going to basically force himself to suffer for his sins, mm -hmm. right? And the actual clergy, if the church itself won't admit that he has sinned, he has to do that himself. You know, this is his way of cleansing himself, of spending the rest of his life in service to not only this old couple, but to this community. Yeah. And, you know, does Lubitsch fully stick the landing on the editing? Does he fully thread the needle, this very difficult needle? You know, maybe not, but it's regardless, it's an incredible ending and I wouldn't change it. For me, the film... It has the tremendous good fortune of beginning and ending, I think, mm -hmm. stupendously. Yeah. I love the last shot, too. It's this shot of Barrymore and Carter on the couch in complete bliss, totally, <laughs> totally unaware. Very like the end of Blue Velvet, you know? <laughs> yeah, where their performances not only foreground their, their newfound, you know, reclaimed happiness, but mm -hmm. also their complete obliviousness. They seem like mm -hmm. a doddering old couple in decline. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> it's absolutely horrific. Mm -hmm. Both times I watched it, Anya and I turned to each other and went, that's so messed up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You ask if it sticks the landing. I think in this case, it's almost like the film, it launches well, sticks the landing well, and then in the middle, it, it loses its way a little. But again, it's never not fascinating to me. Like, even at its most problematic, I'm so fascinated by the performance decisions and the way that it feels like Lubitsch is operating in a new mode for his sound work, which is fully novel to him. And he is discovering how to do it as he goes. He's learning on the job. Totally. I think the movie is, you know, it's raw and imperfect to kind of match the temperament of its characters and their situations maybe not to intentionally match but nevertheless for me for me emotionally it does and yeah like funnily enough just talking about it with you here like i, I find myself liking the movie like more and more mm -hmm. i do feel very moved by the film yeah i would not call it unqualified artistic success but even for that, I feel kind of more protective of it because it's imperfect. There's a lot of films like that that we've covered on the podcast where <laughs> I'm like, okay, this doesn't fully work, but I just love it as its own object that in the places <laughs> where it doesn't overlap with anything else I've ever seen. It, yes, totally. I mean, in this case, we have this I mean, melodrama that, I mean, to touch upon the, the pre-code stuff too, so much about this film politically would have been untenable just a few years later mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because the national mood towards you know, the prospect of another war in this case, you know, over the next 10 years would completely flip. And it, to me, it almost feels like if you've seen Gabriel over the White House or something like that, where a film from this era where there's like a six month period where that film could have conceivably been made and Gabriel over the White House in this case is a full throated call for uh, the president to seize authoritarian power produced mm -hmm. by a major Hollywood studio. And it's uh, terrifying and incredible and very evil. And this one was not evil. It is. <laughs> but what it is, it's just shockingly pacifist. The very idea of war to this film is just this affront to human dignity that that lays waste to communities years after the fact. I mean, the film takes place in 1919, which is a full two years after the, the incident in 
which our you know lead character takes another person's life, and that two years later is seen as such a soul ending thing that can make a whole movie out of it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, very much so. To, to talk about aesthetics for a second, too. The way the actors interact with the material is interesting to me, too. Barrymore is, I think, the only performer here who received any kind of level of acclaim, probably justifiably. I think he gives the, maybe the best performance in the film. But Phillips Holmes, I don't think, you know, he's kind of typical of Lubitsch, I think, has a bit of a leading man problem occasionally. Um, in the Berlin years, the, the problem was named Harry Leadkey. And I do wonder what, what a different actor could have brought to it, you know, to smooth out the r- rough edges of it. Who would be some of your, like, preferred choices? I agree that Phillips Holmes like could be stronger. I I guess I'm curious, like what kind of vibe of actor do you think? What particular kind of charisma could tackle a role like this? I mean, it's a tough role. It's a tough role. How about the idea of like a Colin Clive, Dr. Frankenstein himself, hitting it to the rafters in a full on like weepy dramatic performance in this role? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to see that. I think you could do that. I, I think you could also go with someone like like John Loach, you know, someone mm. who's just like very, you know, chiseled, someone who in another role would just be this like strong hunk mm. brought to this point of just, you know, total vulnerability. That could be an interesting mm. against type. Pluck Jimmy Stewart out of, out of obscurity and make this a star making role. I, I think there's a few that could work or, you know, get Maurice Chevalier on it and have him <laughs> just a current <laughs> yeah. He's, you know, French and he would just with his accent. Oh, I'm sorry. I killed your fiance. <laughs> you know? um, but no, I, I have no good alternatives, which I do think actually gets at how difficult the role is to play. It's mm-hmm. a tough assignment. Lionel Barrymore has the easier role, you know, yes. uh, not to understate what he does. But I like Lionel Barrymore in the film very much. But like there are a lot of actors of kind of that age who could bring the same sort of like gravitas to it. I think that what he does well, I'm kind of praising him for just doing the thing he always does. It's just a good fit for this, which is that he doesn't play his big speech scene as this magnanimous thing. He plays that scene in the same slightly doddering old man. He plays the whole film, right? Who sent that young man out to kill Germans? Huh? Who gave them bullets and gas and bayonets? We, the fathers, here and on the other side, we're too old to fight. But we're not too old to hate. We're responsible. It doesn't sound like something he has written out and he's reading a script. It sounds like the slightly disjointed thoughts of someone just expressing what he feels in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think he does a really good job in that moment where if that scene doesn't play, the whole movie doesn't work. Yeah. Yeah. I really thought that Louise Carter, she was pretty darn good in this. She has way less dialogue than Lionel, just her face and the way that it perfectly does that thing we love in like the great silent film actors where just you look at their face and you look at it slowly kind of melt as the shot goes on as they descend into a puddle of emotions. She does that a bunch of times in this movie. She's clearly very, very good at that thing. Yeah. In a particularly thankless role in the film, like the kind of like least active of the central characters. And yet I remember her more than I do Phillips Holmes. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I can think of more moments of her that I went, wow, she really uh, impressed me in this moment. I think, you know, as far as Phillips is concerned, too, it does help that Lubitsch is so good at just all his best moments are, in my opinion, when he's placed in a scene and the camera movement lighting do the work where, you know, I think maybe his best other side from the ending where I think gen- genuinely he does a great little bit of face acting. His first shot is fantastic where we just see his hands in the pew. You know, everyone's left the church and the slow crane into his hands. And then we peek up over the pew and we see him. That makes him look like a great actor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In so many scenes, you hear the Lubitsch cadence in this movie. And I was so struck by that, where um, after you've seen enough Lubitsch films, you know how he talks, not by hearing him talk, but by he has that, you know, that thing that people often attribute to Quentin Tarantino or Wes Anderson, where you you listen to the characters. So you're like, oh, I, this is a line reading from the director. Yes. Or, or, or like the uh, Lubitsch of the 90s, Kevin Smith. In this case, I mean, Lubitsch was famous for literally walking through scenes and going, do this, do this, do this, and play acting every single scene in front of all the actors. Ah, the thing you're not supposed to do. Yeah. Yeah, And yet, (laughs) and you can see that, especially in the secondary characters, their cadence is Lubitsch's cadence, even when you see those same character actors in other movies and they talk totally differently. There's this melody, this German melody. There was one line, especially where that stuck out. What is in this violin case? Maybe a violin. There you are. That's what's wrong with us. Always trusting, believing anybody. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. A Frenchman yeah. comes along with a violin case, and we take it for granted it contains a violin. Yeah. I, I would bet money that Lubitsch wrote, dictated that line <laughs> because the way it's spoken is identical to like. 20 Felix Brassard line readings in the three films he was in. It is so, so Lubitsch. And it's odd to see it in this movie where it's this otherwise complete, I mean, not otherwise, but this kind of cadence I associate almost exclusively with comedy <laughs> in this in this melodrama. And may, maybe that colored my interpretation of certain scenes. On another note, I don't know quite where I'm going with this, but, you know, many of the Lubitsch comedies are noted as these comedies of manners, or they're very interested in relationship dynamics, sexual dynamics, and about the anxieties surrounding sexual dynamics. Is it too much of a stretch to see, like, sort of the central romantic relationship in this movie, and the way that it ultimately ends up as, like, coming from the same part of his brain that gravitated towards those subjects, like a film like Design for Living or what have you. Does that sound like a stretch to you? Not at all. I think that what are Design for Living and Trouble in Paradise about, if not about the creation of unusual couples? Right. Right. I mean, in Trouble in Paradise, two thieves. In Design for Living, three people. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is, I mean, obviously it's a dour melodrama, but you still have this creation of this covertly unconventional family unit. In this case... Man who killed woman's fiance <laughs> and mm -hmm. them kind of covertly going through life as, you know, just any old family, albeit an international one now. Get Billy Wilder to rewrite this film. Suddenly it's a dark romantic comedy. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. The ending, is, I think I figured it out, at least for me, the ending is in contrast to, you know, the whole movie has been so serious. So but, but also like it's had a foot planted in realism. Everything about it rings true. And the ending frankly, doesn't ring true. It's like, it, it's difficult to imagine this configuration even being proposed, let alone implemented. It's this final drift into like, or departure into like dream world territory. I think for it to work, quote unquote, it would have to be at the end of a movie that was like, that was a little more blackly comic than this one, or, or at least a little more dry that didn't have like, the heavy, weepy stuff. Anyway, I say that and I believe it. Nevertheless, I, I still like the ending because it, there's never been a movie like this. No, it's, and, it's yeah. the France, the Ozone remake connection is so telling because that film, I think, is trying to be more active, kind of spectacular in its ending insofar as a quiet drama can be. Mm -hmm. But this film like shoots for the moon weirdly by keeping it in the living room, mm -hmm. by creating the perfectly messed up, the most messed up possible version of this configuration. Mm -hmm. Very memorable, at least. Mm -hmm. One thing I want to mentioned too is the film was originally called The Man I Killed based on the source material and as kind of a Hail Mary to try and resuscitate the film's box office potential, Paramount <laughs> renamed it Broken Lullaby and its defense of this in an ad taken on the New York Times was they've taken such a personal interest in its success that they have actually <laughs> insisted on a new title for the picture, one more worthy of the greatness of its drama and magnificent love story. Yeah. I think The Man I Killed is probably a better title. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. It certainly jumps out at you. I think the man I killed emphasizes the slightly pulpy nature of this, the convoluted. Yes, yes. Whereas Broken Lullaby comes across as like, this is a very, very serious story. If it was the man I killed, it would set expectations differently. You know, I think the difference is that I can imagine when I think of the words and I take Lubitsch out of my head, the man I killed, I can imagine like a Jacques Tournier film called The Man I Killed mm. or something, right? But if I think Broken Lullaby, I think of like a really self-serious filmmaker like Griffith or something mm. doing it. There's a different contract being created there. My last bit of interesting, and this is the last time we're probably going to talk about Emil on this podcast, was that Lubitsch's first choice for the Lionel Barrymore role was Emil Yannings. Oh, wow. Who had recently moved to uh, back to Europe because the sound era was not kind to his accent. And what great work he would do back in Germany. My goodness. Oh, yes. Great <laughs> films such as... <laughs> such as that all the, all was, those classic films whose yeah. names I can't remember right now. Yeah. <laughs> the most forgettable of Nazi propaganda. We can say goodbye to you, Emil. Uh, uh, we hardly knew you. <laughs> Good riddance, I say. Yeah, Get him out of here. <laughs> <laughs> Go to hell, you old Nazi. Um, <laughs> this is part of the pattern that we've seen so far and, and will continue is that, you know, Lubitsch, the last vestiges of its connection to, you know, his his old collaborators from Europe who moved along with him, the Hans Crawleys, the Polonegris, the Emil Yannings of the world. Uh, his career survives until his heart doesn't. Mm -hmm. To me, it's fascinating just how well Lubitsch managed to not get eaten up by the Hollywood machine at this point mm -hmm. or do something really dumb like sleep with your or run away with your creative partner's wife. <laughs> mm -hmm. Good job, Ernst.
Will, are there any projects of yours or writing or places to find you that our listeners can do so if they so please? Well, no huge projects right now, at least, but I am still ongoing as a podcast mogul. Uh, That's the Important Cinema Club and Michael and Us. Uh, And I'm also on Twitter if you want to harangue me there. Yeah, and I would like to also echo my recommendation. The Important Cinema Club is a wonderful podcast. Oh, uh, thanks so much. I greatly enjoy it. I am an avid listener. And thanks for the invitation to talk about Lubitsch. I enjoyed it, and I enjoyed uh, having an opportunity to talk about this movie in particular. We're in the midst of a run of musicals, and I tell you, after you talked about five Maurice Sevier musicals, (laughs) you start to really yearn for something else. So this is a nice little deviation from the pattern that defines this season. But out of curiosity, have you seen The Merry Widow? I have not, I'm afraid. It's probably my second favorite Lubitsch film. Oh, wow. Behind. Okay. We share a favorite. To be or not to be is, I think, mm-hmm. the greatest American comedy ever made. But The Merry Widow is, um, I actually just recently cajoled our local independent cinema operator into showing it. So I just hosted a screening of it. But So I'm really high on the movie again. It is maybe my favorite musical. <laughs> wow. Okay. Well, that's that's good enough for me. I'm going to make it a priority. I'll say thank you so much, Will, for hopping on the podcast. Uh, it's been fantastic. Thanks for having me. Next week, Matt Severson joins us to discuss One Hour With You. Head over to ErnstCast.com for information as to where you might find the films we'll be discussing this season and other resources such as show notes and our Discord server. How Would Lubitsch Do It is a production of Moving Image Agency. Sophia Yoon was our dialogue editor for this episode. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate and review us on whatever podcast platform you happen to use. It helps other people find our podcast and therefore find Ernst Lubitsch. We'd like to acknowledge that this podcast was produced on the unceded territory of the Musqueam, Squamish, and tsleil peoples. 